Good afternoon and welcome to the Environmental Law Institute. You've joined us for environmental justice. My name is Hannah Keating and I'm the manager of education programs here at ELI. We're delighted to welcome everyone to the final seminar of ELI's annual summer school series. This year marks the official 50th anniversary of the Environmental Law Institute and DLI is reflecting back on our important work in shaping environmental law and governance. This month of July focuses on environmental justice and vulnerable committees, communities, which has led to the addition of this signature summer school session. For more information on our programming, please see the events page on our website, ELI.org, and thank you all for joining us. At the end of today's panel, we'll have time for a question and answer session, and we encourage you to ask your questions at that time. If you're joining us in the room, we have a microphone to bring around at that time. And if you're joining us through GoToWebinar, please submit your questions through GoTo's question box. And please not wait until the end. Send your questions as soon as you think of them. I'd like to thank our outstanding panelists for joining us today to lend their expertise and leadership to the summer school. While I introduce them very briefly momentarily, their full speaker bios are posted on our website, www.eli.org, and I encourage you to check out their expertise and experience in more detail there. As we begin, I would like to briefly introduce today's panelists. Dr. Ryan Emanuel is an associate professor and university faculty scholar with the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources at North Carolina State University. Ryan has served on the North Carolina Commission of Indian Affairs Environmental Justice Committee since 2014, working with American Indian tribes and organizations to promote sovereignty through accurate disclosure and analysis of demographic and environmental data. Tamara Tolls O'Laughlin is the North American Director at 350.org, where she supports her critical, which supports critical work of building a multiracial grassroots climate movement that holds leaders accountable to social and to science and justice. We also have Mike Ewell, is the founder and director of of Energy Justice Network, a national support network for grassroots community groups fighting dirty energy and waste industry facilities. And we have Dr. Carlton Waterhouse, who's a professor at Howard University School of Law, where he teaches property and environmental law courses and is working to start the first ever environmental justice center at Howard Law School. As you can see, we have a really fantastic panel and a wonder variety, wonderful variety of experience. Uh, thank you all so much for contributing to this year's summer school. And with that, I'll turn things over to you, Tamara. Sure. I'm excited to go first. It means I couldn't possibly do a terrible job. <laughs> um, so my name is Tamara Toldo Laughlin. I always say it's the most complicated thing you'll learn about me. Uh, it took me some 30 years to get through the first two, and then I added that last one. Um, so I, oh, huh, I wonder. Is this, um, let's see. here we are. So I always start with this slide, that way the um, going sentiment that there are no people of color in the environment, I've just destroyed that for you, because uh, there you see a woman of color in the environment. Um, <laughs> I, it's important for us to think about the fact that this is a conversation about our norms that get um, enshrined in the way that we codify the ways we work together, which sometimes is in the law, sometimes in policy legislation, and is mostly informal. Um, so I really just wanna like do a high level conversation about uh, where some of the work is going now, the trendy hot topic parts of it that uh, make you get up at night and check your Twitter when you should be sleeping. Um, <laughs> So this is a bit of a brief introduction of myself. If I, my whole life could fit in a slide, this is it. Uh, the things I love, uh, the things I adore, um, the communities I'm a part of, which everybody in this room and online is now a, a part of. Um, my, I come from a long line of folks who get active around the things that they care about. And one of the things I learned is that community is really the greatest place for us to do our work. It's an amplifier of everything that's good. It makes learning uh, happen in a natural way and really creates space for us to do more than what you know our current um, methodology through Twitter or Medium or any other ways that we communicate with each other and really provide space for long-term relationship building and the development of how we're going to live. So I'm happy to talk more about that at another time, but just to give a little background on how I got in this chair, um, these are some of the places where I do my work. So I went to Vermont Law School in 2009. I did my uh, JD in environmental law and policy and did my master's in energy gen generation and transmission, uh, mostly focusing on carbon constraints, right? So I'm in the right job for climate. Um, but, but in terms of thinking about how that plays out every day, these are some of the organizations where I do that work. Uh, Green Leadership Trust, East DC Eco Women, I just left there as the chair where I was for six uh, years a member and then left as president. Uh, I am now the chair of Women's Voices for the Earth in Missoula, Montana, so I get to spend a lot of time talking to people who approach all of this from a very different angle on what it means to talk about justice. 
uh, when we talk about the exclusion of people from things that should include them, decisions that are being made that impact their health and livelihood and safety, it is really interesting to put those words, that language, and that thinking into the hands of people who are also excluded but look like they shouldn't have that nomenclature. So uh, these are a couple of other places where I hone my craft, uh, Council of Governments here in D.C., Metropolitan Washington. So I work on Air Climate Public Advisory Committee, which covers D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. And given how terrible our air quality is, I do not feel excited about that. Um, the other places, sometimes I'm agitating in the Maryland government because I live here. So what brings me here today is the multiracial, multigenerational, identity conscious nature of what we have to do to make climate work for people. And some of that is about reconnecting it to environmental justice. It has been an interesting lifelong journey. I am at this moment 40 years old. So in my lifetime, environmental justice has been a cool, bendy, trendy like fad that has gone nowhere for exactly 30 years. And three times in my development, I've been a part of different at different levels of the work of getting uh, this concept out, figuring out what kinds of things we win, working with communities who are throwing themselves into helping to raise the bar for uh, the general understanding that people who live things don't know things. Um, and so it is really, really important for us to think about what it means to build a climate movement by connecting it. it is, climate only exists as a leaf on a branch of social justice work. And if we are not thinking about that in the way that we frame our um, actions, the tactics won't matter because our strategy is flawed. Also, we're borrowing plenty from social justice in order to develop the tools that we're using. So if we think about it with a lens that started yesterday or with 280 characters, we're really missing the boat on what is the global connective tissue for work that we could do um, here in the environment in the US. So the question that I pose usually when I am in dialogue about these things is, why do we need political action to protect people and the planet? Uh, everybody in here understands that there are things that you can do and things that you say, but there are things that last. And most of that is enshrined in how we work together. So I'm sure the other panelists will really go in depth on the pieces of legislation that have helped us to really enshrine um, the case law that we study um, and the huge gaps. But so I'll, so I'll be the light and cheery part of <laughs> this conversation. This is a basic background that I, um, work with just to give people a scope for the idea that environmental justice didn't just appear out of nowhere. It is like a spoon. Someone invented it one place and then it came up in another place. But there are communities in the US context of us deciding who gets to live near what, who is excluded from basic services, and how we function that are enshrined in these sort of benchmarks around how we started to mobilize for environmental justice, where the federal government came in. And one thing that I will tell you flatly, regardless of the current state of the EPA and all the great people that are still there trying to make something happen, despite what is going on, the federal definition for environmental justice is not a universal definition for environmental justice. What we define as the federal government's relationship to its resources and people using the people's money, it's not the same thing as what communities who are experiencing harm currently define as their liberation. And so we really need to pay attention to the movements where, where this is really clear, uh, the things that have emerged ever since. So the National People of Color Environmental Justice Leadership Summit, many of the folks who were there are still alive. So we are not, we don't have to search for um, backing to, to, to get past what we have decided in you know one of the, the tri-state area is really the most important definition, which is what the federal government is gonna do about justice. Um, other parts of the timeline, the executive order, 12898, every person who works in this space hangs their hat on the fact that it exists. Hopefully no one will whisper it too loud because it's such a weak protection that we could lose it today if, that, if, it, if it gets out. So don't tell anybody about this conversation. <laughs> um, there are other groups who have worked on um, really, really organizing around what those principles mean, how they get operationalized, and some really different sectors. Um, in 1998, you'll see in this uh, slide that the wing spread statement and a precautionary principle, which has still not been adopted here universally and is not the sort of thing that can come up in legislation in a way that is sensible, is a part of the conversation in the same way the HEMES principles are, in the same way the different groups are coming together. Um, there are other things happening at the state level, which have been interesting secondary notes on what we try to do in the federal space, because we don't really have a lot to stand on in the federal government. We have the way that the government deals with itself around procurement as a possibility to think about some of these things. I'm happy to talk about that more, 
But ultimately, what we're trying to do in this space where we're talking about the precautionary principle or we're talking about all of this policy, the Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Clean Air, CERCLA, RICRA, Toxic Substances Control Act, versions one, two, three, and who cares? Like, I think, honestly, we have to have a conversation about what isn't working around these things and what happened during the framing of these specific pieces of legislation that have failed to reach communities that have been suffering ever since. We've been tracking them and before then. Um, so one of the things that I think is particularly instructive for all of us who are practitioners on no matter what side of the line we're on is that we live in the times, like we'll look back and think these are the salad days. We have the most robust set of environmental laws ever constructed and we still don't answer basic questions. So on that slide deck, you'll see a couple of the things that I think are really sort of flat examples of how we miss it. So we have an environmental justice framework. We have all of those laws, and yet we still can't make a connection between uh, the dollars we spend on transportation, air pollution, and the death of communities every day. It's the thing that we can look at and figure out. If you want to look for a community that isn't on it, that is on an EJ screen that is currently experiencing harm, you can track air pollution to find them because they've not ended up there by accident. They've been designed to that space. And so we have to think about that climate change, flooding, and mold. We have a whole bunch of law, yet we can't seem to lick the thing that is just gonna keep happening. Um, barbershops, beauty salons, and toxic exposure. We have Tosca regulation that has been revamped, uh, been neutered. Um, and one point when it was working, we were able to keep up with almost 1% of the number of chemicals being released. And we still don't have a praxis for how that impacts communities who are the prime targets for being exposed to toxic chemicals, where they work, where they live, where they pray, where they play, where they get their hair done. And when they leave their communities, they are steeped in cumulative impacts, which we cannot get through any legislature if we use those words. That's pretty impressive that we can snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory over and over again with such robust thinking, so many smart people and litigation consistently happening. We have to think about what it means to provide equal access to basic services and why that's still a problem in the modern age, especially because climate change is only gonna be a multiplier of these things. The great uh, climate migration that is coming as people can move from one place to another place unwillingly in the state of our immigration, which penalizes people for it when we're about to be served on that same plate. So I just, so I am not the cheery part of this presentation, mm -hmm. just FYI, I am not. Um, but I do think it's important for us to think about it. And so I am toying with, playing with, experimenting through my work and practice and with a lot of really smart folks who have been in this work for 40 years with what an environmental justice definition could mean that is more useful. So meaningful and informed engagement early and often with impacted communities and decision-making bodies as long-term par partners for the purpose of determining the fair distribution of benefits and if any acceptable burdens. There are so many things that I could say about each one of those things that we would have to start again. So I do think meaningful and informed engagement is probably the most powerful thing that's come out of the federal definition because it allows for that to be interpreted. But early and often is a thing that comes from community groups because they have found themselves in my experience and well before my experience consulted at the very end after a thing already happens and the complaint that happens, whether you are in North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, DC, London, the Virgin Islands, Vermont, any of the places where I have lived and applied this work, people will tell you that early and often is the only way to do it because being consulted to tick off a box at the end does not constitute actual authority. And if we cannot, and if having the power to weigh in does not have the, the authority to change the direction of an action, it is tokenism. So early and often is where, you know, we borrowed that from Tammany Hall, but for the most part, it really matters when we're trying to figure out how people are impacted. Uh, with impacted people and decision-making bodies, that specific part of the language is important because impacted people have lots to say. They have really well-considered thoughts. They have a moral argument. They have data. Everything we've ever heaped on the communities to get to prove that they are being harmed, even though we know they're being harmed because we designed it that way, they have skilled up to get it. So, so if we just organize all the impacted people, we will not solve our problems. I started early in my career doing just that and found out that there was another door. And that's how I ended up going to law school because I thought it was interesting that over and over again, there seemed to be another door. And only people who can get through the door were lawyers. 
And I didn't know what happened on the other side of that door, but I was determined to find out because I was tired of helping to boost the morale of a community that would get dashed because they didn't understand the frameworks. So then I went through that door, came back with some other people, and found out there's yet another door. <laughs> so I, so all, all things being equal, I think it's interesting to think about what does it mean to invest in long-term partnerships with community? What does it mean to co-create for participatory regula regulatory processes that happen at the Public Service Commission, that happen at FERC? Like all of these things could really revolutionize where we end up so that people don't lose a fight that takes them years to figure out at zoning, which happened before they even knew about it. So for the purpose of determining fair and distribution of benefits and if any acceptable burdens, this one is particularly being debated amongst many, many smart people who have well-meaning um, sensibility of how they should work. Because some of us think that we shouldn't accept any burdens or why should we invite communities and folks who are not currently impacted into sharing burdens? Because it invites the zero sum argument. Are we making room for an equivocal statement that nobody should be suffering harm if they're if we can do something about it which takes us back to what the precautionary principle so ultimately having this working definition and consistently trying to improve it by talking to folks who are impacted about where they see themselves where they are being hurt and whether it's invisibilized this is an ongoing process so from this week to next week to two years from now if we win on climate or at least win on moving people on climate this definition will continue to be refined amongst many people who are just trying to figure out how it is we engage the things that exist while we make things happen that do not yet exist. So equity, access, and justice are the three sort of benchmarks for that. What are we looking at in terms of moving people and dollars? Because honestly, the three evils that Martin Luther King recognized are still active, still in play, and knowing them really well does not solve any problems, uh, specifically because as the symbol of every bit of progress we'd ever been able to make in this space, his life was cut off at the point where he started talking about equity. Because you can talk a lot about diversity and making things look right and giving people basic humanity, but when you talk about moving people and resources and changing the status quo so that the state of play is not continually to create a zero sum pie, you get into dangerous territory. That is a lifetime of work. A whole nother generation is picking this up. And hopefully, because so many of us are clear on it and are working through it, we'll get to a place where we stop accepting the status quo is the way that we're gonna build um, and, and or the idea that we're gonna make something out of what we've already failed so many. Uh, access, that's the piece that always gets publicized when we have a conversation about environmental justice, is that people are asking for access. The nuanced thing that has to happen after that is what kind of access? to whom and for how long and what exactly are we going to be accomplishing together? Where's the roadmap that gets us from initial meetings and conversations where we talk about someone being excluded to a meeting where a decision is made when, uh, just to use an example from 350, we have 150 local network groups. 10 are, are called our network council and in preparing for the climate strikes on September 20th, we had a conversation about what it would mean for them to apply an equity, diversity and inclusion lens to their work. So you wanna do a climate strike, what's the most equitable, was that a five or a 15? Okay. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I wear bifocals, so. <laughs> um, law school light, <laughs> law school light. Um, one thing I'll say is that we talk to them about, you wanna do a climate strike, what's the most equitable way to accomplish that? Who are your partners? What kind of resource, crisis always brings resources. When the resources come, who will they be shared with? And these are like local groups of volunteers who don't necessarily see themselves as powerful, but are wielding a form of privilege that can exclude other groups of people who have roots in this fight, who are just as likely to be impacted as them and probably sooner. So when we have a conversation about what does it mean to show up in the streets, we ask them, where are your neighbors? Where are the people you don't necessarily feel comfortable talking to, but live in your zip code and are equally, if not more impacted? What are you doing to show up in places to support work that's already happening? The other questions we asked are, there's gonna be a massive strike global on the 20th. It's what the 21st to the 27th are a ton of other things that are happening. One of the things that are happening is that those folks are gonna turn the mic and their attention to all the work that's been happening. So where are the air quality, where are the health, where are the transportation issues, all of which show up as a part of climate, all of which are entrenched environmental justice issues, none of which are ever covered as we follow three or four really great smart young people through their journey to understand a thing that is enshrined in the way that we do business in America. So 
this is an example of how we have to do more than just provide access if we're going to get to justice. So here's my unsolicited opinion. You can uh, cite me. Corporate bodies do not do justice work. They support it with a focus on equity. So corporate bodies do equity work and people do justice work. If we ever try to, if someone tells you that one is doing the other, you should run away from them <laughs> because they're trying to sell you something and that by the time you figure it out, you'll have invested a lot of time, energy and money, right? So ultimately it's mostly because equity work happens over time and people don't live forever. Institutions carry information in their DNA and the systems and the way they're built, including racism, colonialism, sexism, we've added it there. All of that carries from one generation to another because it's built in the way we design things. And so talking to a room full of lawyers. So, so ultimately, if we are going to assign the work of justice through people to institutions, it has to be through a through line of equity. That way we know that we can count on where the dollars and people are going over time to restore harm, which is an entirely different conversation. Um, so equity, it was all that stuff I was talking about, but here's a working definition that I am focused on as a practice that involves the habitual refocusing of norms to support persons, communities, and groups at the risk of harm in any given action. And here's the hard part, shifting policies, practices, and activities to avoid those harms. Because taking it on and feeling really bad and perhaps, you know, setting yourself on a course for having poor health is not the same as like moving people, dealing with resources, correcting policies, changing procedures, all of those things that will have to happen for us to get to justice. So here's a little bit of a scenario about we're activities that we're under, undergoing right now, none of which, if you talk to the people who are doing it, would seem like they're about environmental justice until you talk to the communities who are impacted, where hydropower, wind, solar, storage, and energy infrastructure questions are always happening. When the EJ folks show up, the question is always, who do I have to avoid getting angry in order to make a thing happen? And the communities who are most likely to be cited near those things are not invited to that conversation unless and until they are causing an obstruction. These are things we could do something about. So the question here is, what does the introduction of clean energy, or clean renewable energy infrastructure do naturally to increase justice, equity, or the enjoyment of nature? And the answer is nothing nothing by themselves because an end is not a means. And we have to think more broadly about the idea that that designing a thing that's good and delivering it in a way that's awful to compound people's problems is not the work of justice. And inviting people in, especially, I mean, we can take, if we put our EJ lens onto all the communities that are being excluded, we come up with things that are happening in the urban space, we come up with things that are happening in the rural space and all the excerpts in between where people are not asked questions about how they might use a thing, they're not consulted on what it's going to be. And in the case of energy infrastructure, they weren't even invited to the original party where we made all these decisions. So all things being equal, none of these great tools solve anything unless we work harder. So the other reason this matters is because human health is impacted by state, federal energy priorities and investments. These are things everyone is clear on, but nobody's clear on how to get to a place where we're talking about justice. Um, there are a bunch of questions there, and yeah, about five minutes for real. Okay, so what's missing from this story? All of the what we talked about is stuff that you either know or have felt or we're getting closer to in your own analysis, because if you stare at the case law, the litigation, the um, public remarks and statements, you sort of get a feeling that we're missing it. We're missing um, how we get to people who want to be included and how we create processes that makes that happen by rote. So, Part of it from the perspective of an environmental organization is that the history of environmental work in and of itself is so completely racist mm -hmm. that it would be really difficult to make a moment for someone other than just talking about centering white people who have taken things. So this is a could be a history of anybody. There are names because they are the founders of some of the biggest green organizations the world has ever seen, but every one of them, the story is really loved nature, deeply hated black people. <laughs> really loved trees, really couldn't stand indigenous populations, and one of them wiped off the face of the earth. So like pick a story, pick a org, that is their origin. I'm gonna skip over it because that's how much that's how much difference there is. So the thing that's exciting is that it wasn't just that. It wasn't just a development of ways of being, ways of seeing problems, the ways of defining it that put us here. There's an entire pathway of legal responses. So it's part of also what makes it look deeply unimpressive to have the thing that's holding EJ together be an executive order. Because we managed to figure out the Indian Removal Act, 
uh, the Homestead Act, all of the suite of Jim Crow laws, the Chinese Exclusion Act does sever, sever um, severality cause, the Immigration Act, which boomerang, um, every form of racial covenant that has existed, including the ones that existed in Baltimore 20 minutes from my house until 1985. I could not live where I currently live until 1985, which meant I couldn't really live there till five years ago because all the people who liked it had to die. So all things being equal, this is sort of the trail of where we have gone to do this work and to enshrine things in a culture that we expect to solve with like one, one really well-worded federal specific response to justice work. I'm not sure that we're, we're gonna get there if we don't make a shift to an equity and justice lens on how we do our work. There are a bunch of, there's some language here that is really useful. Um, equity, justice, fairness, it has to inform a concentric circle of stakeholders who are intentionally provided a capacity to incorporate their directives in our decision making. That's a much longer conversation. I'm really excited about my colleagues really lifting up the spaces about the ways that we end up here if we do what we all care about doing. Um, the root causes, if I shocked you when I said the word racist, don't let me get into conversations about cultural norms of oppression, cumulative impacts and silencing of science, how we falsely limit people's choices and then blame them for being sick. Look at climate. Um, so I think there's a lot to say about how we move from the righteous chorus to what we want to do. The Green New Deal is the sexiest thing we've ever heard of again. And it focuses on three things, jobs, infrastructure, and people. And one of the things that's interesting about it is that like the actual New Deal, it will probably take 13 things at a minimum, actual bills in place now and some that will be born in order to get us to a place where we actually respond to all of this. And the least sexy thing about it is that NAF is probably in there, right? Mm -hmm. So. So I think in order for us to get to a place where we stop making assumptions that send us all down um, a really perilous path, organize what lands as the Green New Deal and things that respond to all of the ways that climate shows up for everybody, it involves going back to an environmental justice lens. Poverty is not a biological function, it's a function of design, which means we have to make new designs. So if we're looking at the Green New Deal, accelerated unemployment or underemployment, pollution and the continuing health benefits that come from it and focusing public entities on public health as a part of their being their mandate and the tools that they have would be really useful so before a, a long candy cane comes to take me out of here um, i just want to talk about what some of these tools are health impact assessments environmental justice review and evaluation fiscal impacts that include environment eco economy policy modeling non-energy community benefit protocols an organic infrastructure redesign are all tools that any group who works in this space ends up getting to at some point. So we should work together to get there faster. Uh, also, Global Climate Strike, I hope to see you out there. I, it is my mission to organize the lawyers. I get emails every day from people who are like, what can I do? Guess what? There's an entire suite of really uh, puni punitive um, uh, um, laws coming to penalize people for exercising their First Amendment right to protest. You know who could solve that? Whole bunch of lawyers focused all over the country on what it would mean to stop making it illegal for people to stop, to, to mention that they're being harmed. So there is work for every sector and there is a lot of work for, envi for environmental attorneys and folks who wanna do justice work. So get at me at any number of these places. My email is my first name, Tamara at 350.org. Uh, if you wanna be a part of what we're organizing to help the legal community respond to climate. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I'll try to pick up this broken mic from the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous job. Um, I, I, this is a wonderful uh, opportunity and thank you for the chance to be here and be on such an uh, auspicious panel and with such uh, informed advocates. So I just want to take a moment to maybe go a little more in depth in some of the issues which um, were just raised by Tamara. And uh, I'm starting with the idea where she kind of finished at the end um, when she talked about the environmental movements, organizers and leaders and, and founders, and the sense that that form of environmentalism is an unsustainable form of environmentalism, right? And so right now, the argument I'm making is that our model of environmentalism 
environmental protection and our model of environmentalism is not one that can last, right? Uh, if we don't shift from it, it's going to fail ultimately. Um, and so let me just say a moment about this and where this comes from. So um, it was recognized in our common future, right? That if you have poverty and inequity as an endemic aspect of your society, then you are not going to be able to resolve the ecological crisis because the human inequity is ultimately going to lead to ecological crisis. And so if we want to address ecological and environmental problems, we have to address the human societal problems of inequity. Um, so when you think about where we are today in addressing issues of sustainability in the United States is a very popular buzzword. Right? We want to be sustainable. We have all kinds of lead buildings and sustainable projects and sustainable organizations. And yet in the United States, the idea of sustainability necessitating equity is kind of not really there. Right? The whole idea of sustainable development is one in its global context, which mandates social equity as a key component, a core component. And yet somehow that's just fallen off in the United States. And so even though today some environmental organizations and agencies are trying to grapple now with the question of environmental injustice, notwithstanding just how old this question is, um, most still don't. They really pay little attention to the issue of environmental justice and the relationship between social, social equity and environmental protection. And um, if we want to just take a moment to go a little bit in the weeds, this is just very little. There's so much more that I could have uh, an entire, a week long conference just looking at what we know about environmental health disparities. But I want to take a moment just to talk about race and um, health disparities that we know and disparities around exposure, right? So for example, if we were to look at the whole question of air pollution, right? We know that when we talk about NOx, we find that there is a disparate exposure rate between uh, white citizens and citizens of color, that's like 38%, which is kind of hard to wrap your head around this kind of disparity. Uh, what the studies found is that even though some people have argued that environmental disparities are really just about class mm -hmm. and people who are talking about race are racist themselves, mm -hmm. um, the reality is that when you control for income, as all going all the way back to the toxic waste and race uh, study that was done by the United Church of Christ, right, the original study, as well as the follow-up 20 years later, we find that race is a much more significant predictor of what your pollution exposure is than this class. Well, we see that here with our second bullet, right? So we find that low-income whites have a lower exposure in America than high-income Latinos when it comes to NOx. Why is that? Because housing in America is racially segregated. People don't just live based on where their class lives. Why? Because America's history was of a race and class-based society. So the structure of the society was classed among whites, but the racialization was always a higher priority. So going all the way back to the early days of American society, what we find even before the revolution was that there was a sense that we needed to distinguish the black indentured servant from the white indentured servant. And so the black indentured servant ultimately becomes an enslaved person who has no opportunity for freedom. Whereas the white indentured servant by law is required to be set free at the end of seven years with certain kinds of benefits and privileges and, 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 and economic um, wealth provided to them, resources, I should say, provided to them. Well, the decision was made, no, the African actually can be enslaved for life and from henceforth, the law shall be used as a mechanism to designate that they shall be, as well as their children and their children's children. Right. So this is where we see how class and race diverge. Right. People who are kind of of the same subordinate class. Now we find a lower level based on your racial identity. 
So it's not the same at the same level of class, right? And we see that same thing throughout American history, and that continues to be with us today. So if we look at asthma rates, we can find a disparity based on, again, Knox, where we find that heart disease, respiratory ailments, and asthma lead to 7,000 additional deaths for people of color based on the disparate exposure that we suffer uh, in America. When the EPA came out with this environmental equity report in 1992, I think it was, which was their first environmental equity report. I had just started working for EPA in the Region 4 office of regional council there in Atlanta. And the agency said in that report, basically, you know, there's a lot of talk about environmental racism going on. We look at this as a matter of environmental equity. And what we find is that there isn't a lot of information that we know about disparities in environmental exposure and health. But there is one that we do know a lot about, and that is the disparity around lead. And going all the way back to that early 1990s report, EPA noted that African Americans are disproportionately suffering from blood, elevated blood lead levels and elevated exposure to lead. It was a problem that the agency recognized and said that they would work to address. Well, no legislation, and notwithstanding the executive order, which came out around the same time, no real movement. What we find is that there has been a movement in the level of blood lead in children in America. It has significant, significantly decreased, but the racial disparities have remained constant, much like mass incarceration. As incarceration rates have decreased, the racial disparities have remained constant. What is the lesson that we're learning here about racially neutral fixes, right? Racially neutral fixes for systemic problems, they may address diminishing the harm that's caused, but somehow the disparities remain constant. What does that tell us about the sufficiency of these fixes that allow us to avoid dealing with the very difficult issue, right? So for lead exposure, we find that today, African-American children remain four times more likely to have elevated, elevated blood lead than anyone else. Asthma rates actually rose from 1999 to 2011 for African-Americans. Black children were twice as likely as their white counterparts to have asthma and had increased rates of asthma attacks and deaths compared to the white counterparts. Um, socioeconomic status also relates to asthma, um, but we find that racial disparities continue to persist even after we account for income and education, right? So we see that the disparate exposure to pollutants also leads to disparate health outcomes, right? And these disparate health outcomes are not addressed by the executive order, right? And there's no legislation. And few people want to address race directly. They want to talk about neutral environmental policies will solve the problem and save the day. And yet we see an increase in health problems even after we have a revised Clean Air Act. So where do these environmental inequities come from? And this is really kind of the core of my talk. And I'm going to kind of move more rapidly here to make sure I conserve the time. And so we have these kind of pervasive and persistent um, and pernicious environmental injustices. And where do they come from? They come from our past. They come from a system of environmental protection and commercial decision-making and corporate profit-seeking that has consistently relegated people without power to become victims of a machine to produce wealth, right? And so we find that people of color in the United States have been historically and remain those who are least empowered to fight this kind of systemic capitalist um, exercise. And so what we find is that there's a problem of the past that has produced this and we see it manifested in where people live. We see it manifested in where people go to school. Right. And where you live and where you go to school is going to tell you about what your environmental exposure is, along with where people work. Right. And all these have been spaces that race has been not irrelevant, but has been very relevant. Very relevant. We have as lawyers, you should know that the case law is filled with cases about questions of race around employment, 
race around education and race around housing. Why is that? Well, I don't know, but maybe a race neutral solution will fix it. Don't count on it, right? Don't count on it. You can't solve the problem by hiding from it. Okay, so environmental injustice, which is what this, um, I think, um, talk has been focused around uh, for our class today, uh, should be understood as a multi-layered multi -layered issue, right? So many people think about environmental justice as a matter of an outcome, right? So we have an inequitable outcome in terms of where pollution exposure and sources are distributed, right? And that's environmental justice. Yes, you're absolutely right. That is environmental justice, but environmental justice is so much more, right? So we can think about the disparities in the outcomes, but that's just the end of the process, right? If you really want to understand environmental justice, you have to go to the beginning of the process, right? So the environmental injustice at the end partially results from the environmental injustice at the beginning. So the corporate and government planning process, which does not include, right, people of color, right, and their perspectives and their experiences and their insights and their community-based um, wishes as part of the planning process is part of the inequity and injustice. It's not that that will just lead to an inequitable outcome, but is, is itself a reflection right, of how race determines who is in what seats in our society, right? And if we want to blame that on past generations, that's fine. But if we want to change that, we can't leave that to past generations. We have to adopt that as a priority for ourselves to make sure that we create a future that looks different than our past, right? So we have environmental justice in planning. You also have environmental injustice in what is the process of decision making, right? At the governmental level, in terms of the political decisions, in terms of legal decisions, financial decisions, economic decisions, all of this decision making, right, is part of where justice takes place. So when communities are not involved in the decision making, legal decision making, political decision making, economic decision making, you are going to produce injustices, right? Procedural injustice is what we're talking about, right? So there can be injustice, and you're law, some are law students, some are lawyers. Hey, if you figure out that the civil procedure is bad, <laughs> then you've got some problems in your case, right? So process matters. Uh, outcomes, we already know, we've already talked about it. And then basically just the inclusion part, right? Who are the political, commercial and legal decision makers, right? And what are the constituencies that are represented through these persons? Okay, so in America, if we wanna talk about issues of race, class, and gender, we are not going to find a helpful analytical tool in a calculus book, a physics book, or an environmental sciences book. You're going to have to look to social science if you want to deal with a social problem. And these are social problems. And they require social scientists, scientific analysis, right? If you want to understand it. For example, uh, the historic manifestations of race, class, and gender bias in our society uh, can be seen in conquest, slavery, segregation, discrimination based on gender and gender expression and ownership rights, education, political rights. And there are social components that basically um, represent the embodiment of those discriminatory practices. And those are legal, those are economic, and those are political. So a very helpful social theory I want to provide to you is a theory of social science. It's called social dominance theory. And social dominance theory basically is a theory that explains why it is that certain groups within societies are able to maintain dominance in their society based on their group identity. So why do we see that? Um, we find that across time, human societies are organized, right, based on group hierarchies. And the people at the top of the hierarchies have higher access to resources. They have control of the institutions of government and commerce, uh, better access to um, safer and healthier environments and power. 
Um, and this exists irrespective of the kind of form of government, the form of the economy, or the religious system, right? And we can see historically that the social psychologists who developed the theory show that these exist around age, gender, and what they call arbitrary set. And arbitrary set dominance is really just saying in one society, it could be race. In another society, it could be class. In another society, it could be your clan. In another society, it could be your tribe, right? But the phenomenon remains the same. So if you're talking about Tutsis and Hutus, if you're talking about the um, the, the Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland, if you're talking about different uh, groups in Japan, right, you can find the same phenomenon. Uh, male dominance basically is a uniform system we see across the world, right? And age dominance is a uniform system we see across the world. Arbitrary set changes from place to place, male and uh, age dominance remain. In the world and in the United States in particular, we see racial dominance, right? And that reflects what are we just talking about some people have a bad intention, some people have racial animus. Bull Connor uh, actually had his, um, you know, lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. Is that what we're talking about? No, we're not. We're talking about the disproportionate distribution of wealth, income, employment, professions, ownership, executive offices, board membership, political power, quality housing, security, educational attainment. Um, of non-Hispanic whites over everyone else in the society. That's what white racial dominance is about, right? It's not about somebody has a bad place in their heart, right? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a society that's built on providing opportunities and privileges for one group at the expense of others. That's the history of America, whether we like it or not. That was the plan. That's not an accident. That was the plan of the framers, and they were very talented, so it worked very well, <laughs> okay? And so we have to recognize that, right? And if we want to continue with the plan, let's acknowledge it and say, we're going with the framers' plan, right? If we want to discontinue it, we need the same level of intentionality. It's not going to accidentally fall away. Okay, so what do we see this? What does this look like in environmental space? I haven't given my social scientists a bit now, right? So in environmental space, it looks like access to green and clean spaces, clean drinking water in homes, clean soils and surface water in residential communities, higher resilience, greater control over natural resource decision-making, control over environmental decision-making, right? So the degree that this is a race and gendered and a classed reality, this represents social dominance, the environmental consequences of the social hierarchy of the society. What are the costs of being a subordinate group member in this society? The cost is that you higher risk and lower resilience. You have less access to clean water and soil and surface water contamination are more likely. You're much more proximate to waste facilities. You have increased pollution exposure in your homes, schools and jobs and increased morbidity and disease, right? So how does this happen? How does this work? What are the mechanisms? I'm gonna go really quick to this. I'm gonna to try to explain it in a very short shorthand. So, there's the beliefs and the ideas in the society. There are the institutional structures that kind of reinforce and replicate the hierarchy of the society. And there are the individual preferences or members of the society. So think of it this way. In terms of social ideologies and beliefs, the brain, right? The ideas that legitimate and justify why the hierarchy exists. The institutions, those are the hands of hierarchy in the society. They are the things that actually replicate the hierarchy on a daily basis. And the individual preferences, this is how different members of the society connect with the institutions and the ideas. So some people have a high social dominance orientation and they tend to populate organizations that are the hands that replicate dominance. And some people have a low social dominance or orientation and they, populate the organizations and institutions that tend to diminish or minimize or attenuate dominance, right? And of course, the institutions that replicate and reproduce dominance are much more powerful uh, than the institutions that are working around the edges, right? Um, so beliefs and ideologies, we can look at examples of those like the culture of poverty, white supremacy, just world belief, divine right of kings, manifest destiny, meritorious karma, Male supremacy, you know, um, women, 
female in superior, uh, excuse me, inferiority. Um, in the environmental context, you can think about some of these ideas you may have heard in your organization or among some friends or colleagues or others who you were protesting. Only class determines environmental quality, if anything. Real estate costs decide where weight facilities are located. People of color move to the polluted areas. Environmental protection is race and class neutral. Racial discrimination doesn't exist without racial atoms. Right? These are the ideas that allow environmental inequities and injustices to be replicated. And as long as you're thinking these ideas, you're actually not going to produce change. Right? What about the beliefs that try to minimize or diminish uh, hierarchy in terms of our society? So things like human rights, a belief in civil rights, right? which to us today, for us, makes sense. Everybody should have civil rights, of course. Well, of course, before the civil rights movement, we wouldn't have been saying that. All right? Um, Feminism, womanism, socialism, ethnic racial pride, these are ideas that push back on the ideas that legitimate and justify the dominance of some groups over others. So what does that look like in the environmental context? Environmental racism requires systemic reform. People are entitled to environmental justice. Community-centered decision-making is a priority. Implicit race and gender bias, bias requires attention. And intersectional race and gender discrimination is the norm on corporate boards and executive offices, right? If you don't recognize these kind of realities, then the other ideas will cause you to kind of go with the status quo and say, this is just the way it is, right? Um, so there are institutions that enhance hierarchy. Those are the ones that reproduce it. So we talked about that. The question is, where does your institution fall, right? Are you in an institution, a firm, a nonprofit, a governmental agency that replicates the disparity in environmental quality and experience or one that minimizes it? If you're in one that doesn't minimize it, then guess what? You're in one that replicates it. There is no neutral ground here, right? If you are an environmental organization that protects everyone without regard to existing inequities in the society, you're basically maintaining status quo, just to let you know that. So if you're the police department in Birmingham, Alabama, who's maintaining the Jim Crow laws, you're just maintaining the law. You're actually the one who's causing and continuing racial segregation in Birmingham. You're the one that's being picketed and protested because you're part of the problem. Yeah, just to let you know. Um, in the same way, animals have distinct impacts upon them as a result of human development. We have to understand human communities based on their experience also impact pollution, uh, experience the impacts of pollution differently. Right. And so we have to be mindful of that in the way we go about addressing our environmental uh, problems. So in closing, as my time has uh, lapsed, um, I'll just note that we as lawyers have a particular responsibility, I think, within our organizations, be they big law, be they the federal government, be they state agencies or be they nonprofits to think about law in a way that recognizes that environmental law is not neutral. It rests on a society that has existing set of hierarchies based on identity. Now, environmental law, if it's going to be protective and sustainable of everyone, it can't ignore, it must engage and address these issues as well. So if you're learning environmental law without learning about dealing with these social equity problems, then you're basically learning how to maintain and keep them, right? And so I challenge you if you're a student to challenge your professors, and I challenge you if you're a lawyer at a firm to challenge your partners, and if you're a partner, I challenge you to, I, I encourage you to challenge your fellow partners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to see these as real. If you care about the environment, you can't be like, oh, wow, I'm so glad we were able to protect that um, that endangered forest. Uh, what is that gentrification just completely wiped out the folks in uh, Ward 7? Okay, well, I live in Ward 8. All right, so <laughs> not a problem for me, right? So you have to recognize the connectedness within the human society in the same way we recognize the connectedness in the ecological society. To me, it's like a no-brainer, but you know, we still have to think about it. So ultimately, um, I would just encourage folks to get engaged around this issue of environmental justice, see it as the multi-layer um, problem that it is, and think about how you fit in the social dominance paradigm of the society, whether or not you are an agent working like Neo and others in the matrix to <laughs> overturn the system, or whether you are more like Mr. Smith and uh, the agents who are just looking to 
keep the system plugging along. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you all for allowing me to, to join this um, esteemed panel. I'm really um, uh, really gotten a lot out of the uh, first two speakers. I want to thank them uh, for setting the stage and setting a very high bar uh, for me. So thank you for that. I want to um, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I think I, I, I need some additional uh, context to give to you all. Uh, I'm, I'm not an attorney. I have no legal background. I'm a scientist. I'm a water scientist, a hydrologist by training. Uh, a lot of my work focuses on water quantity and water quality in natural environments. So I geek out over things like how much water is in the river right now? What's <laughs> dissolved in that water? I mean, these are the things that uh, I, I, I love to think about. Uh, but I'm also an enrolled member of the Lumbee tribe. It's the largest American Indian tribe in the Eastern United States, the ninth largest uh, tribe in the U.S. Uh, they exist in a precarious position with respect to the, the uh, federal government and their acknowledgement. They're still um, recognized partially under a 1956 federal law. Uh, and so it's a, it's a tenuous uh, position, but as a Lumbee person, uh, I grew up in the, the first generation after segregation. My, my parents uh, came up in a three-way segregated community that was black, white, and Indian. Uh, they moved to the city shortly before I was born, and I, I grew up in an integrated environment, benefited from uh, a progressive busing program in the public schools in the city where I lived. And so I sort of grew up with a, a foot in both of these worlds, these deeply ingrained uh, values of my Lumbee community, but also uh, living in this urban environment. Uh, but this photograph right here is taken uh, from alongside the Lumbee River. This is where our tribe derives its name. Uh, we are people of the dark water. So the, the river here has uh, a dark coloration that's very unique and characteristic. And, uh, we have values that include respect for the river and reciprocity with the river. And to some extent, that informs uh, my decision to go into water science uh, as a career. Several years ago, uh, I, I offered to be a resource to Indian tribes in my state, uh, including the Commission of Indian Affairs, which is a, a representative body of all of the tribes within North Carolina that's formed under the uh, the executive branch of the state government. And one of the first things that they asked me to help with, I said that you know, I'd be happy to help uh, with any environmental issues, you know, thinking about water and water quality and water quantity and all of these things that I love. One of the first tasks uh, that they sent me on was environmental justice. I said, I don't know anything about environmental justice, but okay, we'll figure this out uh, together. And uh, my introduction to environmental justice was uh, just a, a general read of some of the history that it, that happened in my own state and not only within North Carolina but uh, a, a company based in the very city where I live and teach today and this was not a part of my education as a scientist I didn't learn anything about the events that led up to the modern environmental justice movement including the the siting of a, a landfill in the predominantly African-American community uh, of Afton in Eastern North Carolina after a company based in Raleigh uh, dumped PCBs uh, late at night along hundreds of miles of country roads throughout Eastern North Carolina. And so these images uh, like this and the stories that go along with them really uh, struck me. And it made me realize that there's a whole different dimension to understanding the environment uh, that, that than I was taught throughout my undergraduate and graduate education. And moreover, I'd been teaching students for years at the university level without any uh, context other than my own personal experience as a, as a Lumbee person for understanding how people interact with the environment. So it was a very humbling experience 
uh, for me. But as an outsider um, to this field of scholarship and this field of practice, I tried to stay pretty close uh, to you know, what we might consider uh, the uh, of official definitions for some of these terms. So I, I, when I engage with policymakers and when I engage with other members of the public, I tried to use their terms and their rules. Uh, and so these are, these are some of the ways that I use um, uh, when I talk about environmental justice in the public sphere. I do point to the executive order uh, and within that executive order, we see some, some key phrases. But I first want to acknowledge uh, what Tamara said, that you know, this is not the only way to define environmental justice. Um, this is a very limited definition. But I've decided to start within this definition and pull out some important themes. For example, fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people in decisional processes surrounding the environment. And then within the executive order itself, there's a task that's set forward to federal agencies to one, identify, and two, address disproportionately high and adverse human health or environmental effects of these actions on vulnerable populations. Then there's a, a caveat there at the end, to the greatest extent practicable and permitted by law. And you know, some would say that might undercut uh, the, the first clause of that sentence. Uh, but at any rate, these are the definitions that I uh, use in my work and I bring to the table as a scientist. Uh, and what do I do? So one of, one of the things I've been involved with over the past several years is uh, deconstructing and evaluating and critiquing the technical analytics that decision makers use uh, to demonstrate that environmental justice impacts do or do not exist. Uh, most frequently, to be honest with you, the the uh, the conclusions is the conclusion is that there are no environmental justice impacts to a particular decision or particular action. Um, but I decided to step into that space. Others had gone in there before, and within the first ten years or so of issuing the federal executive order on environmental justice, uh, publications had reviewed a lot of the environmental reviews uh, that have been published by various agencies and shown that by and large, environmental justice analyses concluded uh, that there were no impacts. So it's very common if you review an environmental assessment or environmental impact statement for there to be an environmental justice section, uh, but that section uh, will more often than not conclude that there are no uh, substantial or significant environmental justice impacts. So you can go back through uh, the records from most agencies and you'll find that this is the case. Uh, what do these analyses look like? So you, you will find these typically in the socioeconomic sections or appendices of federal environmental reviews. These are assessments or environmental impact statements, but they, they often have a key uh, characteristic that they share in common. They're comparisons between uh, study areas and reference areas. And these often involve comparisons of demographic data that you might cull uh, from the US Census or an American Community Survey or something like this. Uh, study areas tend to be uh, demographic areas that are located in proximity to, um, to a, a, a proposed site or a facility or a, an area that's associated with an action, then in order to understand whether or not a population within a study area is being disproportionately impacted, uh, the word disproportionate uh, suggests that you need something to compare it to. So an analysis also requires a reference area. And frequently these reference areas can be the counties within which those demographic units are contained, or it could be a whole state, it could be an EPA region, or it could be the entire United States. And so down below, this is a, a screenshot from a project that I recently worked on. It was a, a fossil fuel pipeline on the West Coast. And you can see that there are um, 
uh, demographic units surrounding this red pipeline as it traces its way across the landscape. And the units are colored uh, in proportion to, in this case, American Indian populations living within those census units. So we have these study areas, and then we can compare that to the state as a whole or to the counties where those are situated or to some other area. But you'll find the general gist of these analyses is they do take uh, some study area and compare it to a reference area. One other tool that's out there is uh, the EPA has published this online tool called uh, EJ Screen. It's a screening and mapping tool. And this allows you to uh, select your own study area and then it provides three levels of comparison. There's a comparison to the state where that study area is situated, to the larger EPA region, these are sub-regions of the United States, and to the US as a whole. And so this tool is available for anyone to use. Uh, it's not just uh, agency access, but it's publicly accessible. Uh, but you'll find on the website that there are some caveats that go along with this. And I actually like the, and respect these caveats because the creators of EJ Screen are very careful to say that this tool is intended to be a first step in an environmental justice analysis uh, that may lead you or should lead you uh, to, uh, to uh, digging deeper into some of the issues that may be revealed upon uh, screening. So there are these clear caveats that EJ Screen's only intended to be a first step in a much larger uh, process. So one of the things that I have found is that uh, uh, agencies are free not to use EJ Screen, right? Because we have no environmental justice legislation. We're guided by this executive order. Uh, we cannot force or uh, agencies are not forced to use particular metrics or methods or analyses in order to study environmental justice. And as a water scientist, I will often hold up in contrast uh, some of the methods that we have surrounding um, uh, wetland assessment and wetland regulation. The Clean Water Act uh, has instigated um, a number of um, uh, a number of, of tests and assessments and mitigation rules surrounding um, how we protect and conserve and preserve streams and wetlands in the United States. And the tools that we have have been debated over and developed by technical experts and been subjected to scholarly scrutiny for a number of years. They're not just put out there. Um, you know, there there's a lot of, of legwork that goes into developing and vetting these tools. And then the states agree that these are the tools that we're going to use going forward. And we just don't have that same level of uh, review and oversight over environmental justice uh, methodologies for these types of analyses. So while EJ Screen is a great tool, it is essentially just a recommendation uh, for agencies to use. And some agencies tend to use uh, their, their own tools. One of the ones that I have uh, worked on recently is a demographic tool that works a little like this. So here's a cartoon to illustrate. Let's say we have a study area that's made up of several census tracts. These are uh, sub-county level units. Each circle on my screen uh, represents a census tract. The area of that circle is proportional to the population of the tract. So big circles have larger populations, small circles have small populations. The orange circles are census tracts that have disproportionately large minority populations relative to the reference area. The green circles uh, do not have disproportionately large minority populations relative to the reference. So in one test that I've looked at recently and reviewed, the logic goes something like this. There are eight census tracts that have disproportionately large minority populations, but there are 12 that do not. Because 12 is greater than eight, there's no environmental justice issue. That's just, that, that is the logic that's included in the environmental impact statement. Now, if we look at this and we look at the total area that's occupied 
by those circles, uh, the orange area or the area with disproportionately high minority populations is clearly larger than the green circle. So this is to say that these metrics and these tests that are used are not necessarily, um, they're not necessarily neutral. You know, and I will, I will refer you back to Carlton's discussion about neutrality and, and policy and decision making. So we can put on errors uh, that our analytics are somehow neutral or somehow um, without bias, um, but the very way that we, um, that we tabulate and tally up uh, our, our numbers when we're doing these analyses could be infused uh, with some bias that actually allows us to miss some important environmental justice implications associated with the project. And so for one of the projects that I've looked at that included this logic in the federal environmental justice uh, analysis, uh, I, I re-ran the numbers to simply look at the overall disproportionality for American Indians. This is one of the projects that I worked on uh, uh, through the Commission of Indian Affairs. What I found was that for this particular project, uh, American Indians make up just over 1% of North Carolina's population, just over 6% of the population of the impacted counties. But for the study area, for the tracks through which this project would pass, they make up over 13% of the population. So that is a textbook example of disproportionality. Um, and this is important because this particular project cuts through the territories of several American Indian tribes. Uh, because these, some of these tribes are in the same boat as the Lumbee, and they're not listed among the 570 tribes in the federal register that have full federal recognition, uh, federal regulators may not know to communicate with those tribes. They don't show up on the list. You know, you're you're perhaps checking your box, well-intentioned or or just box checking, looking at American Indian tribes with whom you may need to engage. Uh, these tribes don't show up on your list, with the exception of uh, the Eastern Band of Cherokee, located in the far western corner of the state. Your analytics didn't flag anything. You used a test with logic that masked the impacts of this project on uh, uh, minority communities. And so you don't have any, any dashboard or intelligence uh, coming at you to, to, to help you know that it's important to engage with these communities. And as a result, those communities are sort of lost in the ether. And if they hadn't spoken up for themselves to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, we are massively overrepresented within the study area of this project, uh, there would have been uh, no discussion, you know, not even a, an 11th hour discussion. And that indeed is what, what did happen and what is still happening with this particular project is that it has turned into an 11th hour discussion about how to identify and address uh, the impacts of this particular project uh, on these indigenous communities. So I'll give you one more little wonkish example and statisticians uh, use this little matrix to talk about uh, reality versus predictions, right? So if you have a test that predicts some particular outcome and that outcome actually does happen in reality, that's called a true positive, right? If you have uh, predicted that something will happen and it doesn't happen, uh, in reality, that's called a, a false positive. That's the lower left-hand corner. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, if you predict that, that something will not happen, but it actually does, that's a false negative. I'll give you a medical example. So uh, you could think about these as medical tests, right? You want a medical test that's gonna give you a true positive outcome. Let's say that um, you, know, you have to have some type of uh, biopsy in a cell test for cancer. You want that test to be accurate. You don't want a, a false positive. You don't want to be subjected to treatments that you may not need, but you also don't want a false negative. You don't want a physician to reassure you that the test has said there's absolutely nothing wrong when there is. 
And so this is a statistical topic called statistical power. And so some of my work, because we use the same types of statistics in hydrology and environmental science, I, I've tried to frame these um, problems with environmental justice analyses uh, as problems of statistical power. Basically, we want to reduce false negatives. We don't want to falsely conclude that there are no environmental justice impacts when in actuality there are, because that, um, uh, that, that diminishes the voices uh, of people who are already uh, long taken out of the decision-making process or excluded from the decision-making process. And so uh, some of the, mo we've done some simulation modeling work to show that uh, for one of, one of the tests that is used in federal environmental justice analyses under real life conditions, it has a 100% false negative error rate. <laughs> that is crazy. If you have a test that will give you a, a negative result no matter what the conditions. So in or, what we've also found is in order to reduce the false negative error rate to 5%, that means 95 times out of 100, you're gonna get the correct answer. That's pretty good. That's not, that's not the standard for medical tests. But that's an acceptable standard in, in many of the environmental sciences you would have to bump up the, dispropor the disproportionality to a four to one disproportionality. You know, that means if uh, American Indians or some other vulnerable population make up 10% uh, of the, the reference population, they'd have to make up 40% of the study population uh, before they're even detected reliably by this particular test. So that's a little uh, wonkish example of some of the work that I do. Uh, we've also connect, We've also tried to extend this to the country as a whole to say how many census tracts in the United States are vulnerable to being overlooked by this particular test that is uh, common in, in federal uh, environmental impact statements. And it turns out that throughout the US, you know, between 25 and 45% of the census tracts in each state are vulnerable uh, to having these populations overlooked. This is not simply a matter for um, uh, the, the vulnerable populations themselves. You know, these are issues for regulators because it complicates regulatory proceedings. These are issues for developers. You know, if you have an interest in a project, this could uh, substantially set back your, your progress or hinder your project. So I, I try to, to, to make this, as broad, this work as broadly applicable as possible, and I've said as much in some of my writing. Uh, this is not just a, a U.S. policy issue. This is international policy. The U.N. Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People has called for uh, free and informed consent before infrastructure projects are developed. Uh, on, in indigenous territories. And so this harkens back to some of the things that Tamara said uh, about the need to have these conversations very early in the process uh, to avoid tokenism and these 11th hour uh, uh, discussions. So I'll wrap up with some takeaways. Uh, we need accurate environmental justice analyses and we need analyses that have gone through technical rigorous review because if we don't have them we're going to exacerbate the invisibility that vulnerable communities already experience the second point i want to make is that all of these tests even though i love spending my time with these technical tools all of these tests are only first steps in a thorough analysis and this relates to carlton's point about this being a social science issue. I can give you all the math and all the statistics in the world, but really there are social science methods uh, that need to be investigated, need to be employed uh, in this kind of work. And some last implications for policy and decision making. Uh, I want to reemphasize environmental justice doesn't require a discriminatory intent. Numbers can speak for themselves and the communities aren't on the hook to prove that something was done in a deliberate fashion. And I wanna end by saying that these injustices can't be mitigated 
without input from the affected communities. So if you don't include the communities that are being impacted in these discussions of solutions, you're just reinforcing the status quo. And so, for example, in some of the projects that I've worked on, I've had responses to allegations of environmental justice that go something like this. It's okay because our economic development efforts are actually restoring social justice. And I have to ask, you know, were the impacted communities involved in those discussions about what economic development looks like? Because if they weren't, uh, then you're reinforcing the status quo. So these are some of the lessons that I have learned over the past few years of my work in environmental justice, and I hope this has been uh, helpful and valuable to you all. I want to thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Ewall. I'm the founder and executive director of Energy Justice Network. We're a national group based in Philadelphia. I live both there and in D.C. area. And we help communities fight off dirty energy and waste facilities. Um, I got involved when I was still in high school um, near Philadelphia in 1990. They tried to build an incinerator in my hometown, and I worked on fighting that and just never stopped. So I've been working with communities all around the country um, to fight similar things. And it took until um, I saw an email in 2008 that had a subject in all caps that said tuition free law school for <coughs> and I was like, My jaw hit the floor and I, when I picked it up, I was like, all right, I guess I'm going to have to move out of Pennsylvania for the first time and come to D.C. So I went to the University of D.C., an activist from law school, got my free law, de almost free law degree. There's an asterisk in there, lawyers. Um, and decided when I was going in that I wasn't coming out so I could change my job, so I can join a firm. Um, wear a legal hat all the time. I just wanted that legal tool in my back pocket so I can use it to be more effective what I'm already doing. So I'm not a lawyer all the time. Um, sometimes I'm out actually asking lawyers to practice more often for help with certain things. Um, but some of the things I have been doing since well before I even knew I was going to law school is using local ordinances to stop polluters. We've had successes, uh, especially in this past year, our biggest ones yet. Um, we got the Baltimore Clean Air Act passed, the law that I wrote to force the biggest air polluter in the city of Baltimore to close down by next year. Um, and also the nation's largest medical waste incinerator also is there. Um, the other one is a trash incinerator. And so we're working on things like that, and we're very successful at taking out um, industries, especially proposed facilities. This year is the big turning point where we're showing that we can take out existing polluters as well as just preventing new ones. Um, but we have a long history of um, dozens and dozens of victories across the country, communities that we've either led the battle in or helped people uh, lead their own battles in stopping polluting industries. And I'm glad to hear from someone from the Lummi tribe. I don't know if you can still hear me, um, but we have to talk soon because there's a poultry waste incinerator plan for Lumberton and we need to make sure to get that stopped. Um, so let me um, see what else I need to say before I jump into the presentation. Okay, one, one thing, um, aside from the victory in Baltimore, we and, and we are looking for lawyers to help out with that, but um, it's just being sued over now, and we're hoping to make sure that holds up in court. Um, but also, we got, um, also this past March, got a law passed in upstate New York in a town where the largest cement company in the world is um, has a facility burning um, coal, but trying to burn trash and tires and other wastes um, right next to a, a grade school. And so uh, we got law passed, I wrote the tire, town hired me to write a clean air law that is similar to the Baltimore one, uh, passed, and now the company's trying to take over the town. So now we have an opportunity to follow up clean air laws with clean elections laws. I'm looking for folks who have clean election law experience because I've not done that yet, although it's a big interest of mine, to figure out how we do that to keep the company from taking over the town this year's election. So this is just a, a shout out for those who have experience or want to help in those kinds of things. All right, so we're going to move into this. I'm going to go fast. I always do. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, there's a lot of stuff to go over. Um, so, yeah, let's just jump right into it. All right, so some of the stuff I'm going to skip over a little bit because you've already uh, heard enough from the previous speakers who did some amazing um, work that they put out there already. Um, so, environmental racism, basically, um, we're looking at the fact that I, I should need to change the side. Not just communities of color, but people of color, and you'll see later in the presentation why I'm saying that, are more heavily impacted. Um, by toxic industries. And that's where a lot of the language around environmental racism first came from. And um, as the previous speaker pointed out, it doesn't need to be intentional. You don't need 
um, obvious stuff like uh, some of you might, are too old to remember or too young to remember this, but Texaco was busted kind of some executives were talking about how the, the black jelly beans stick to the bottom of the bag when justifying how black workers were not um, being elevated in terms of promotions in the company. You don't need evidence like that for discrimination to be a violation of the Civil Rights Act. And the Civil Rights Act makes it clear, and certain legal cases also do, that it doesn't need to be intentional. It just has to be discriminatory effect for it to be a violation of the Civil Rights Act. Now, your ability to sue over it, that's a whole other story we'll get into. Um, now, Zaline's a woman I worked with for about 25 years now in Chester, Pennsylvania, known as one of the worst cases of environmental racism in the country. Um, that's the one community I've worked on more, longer than any for 25 years now. And people even there like to say, oh, it's just because they're poor, right? Well, her office, her community group's office was broken into twice. One of the times vandals wrote KKK on the wall. If it were just about class, you wouldn't see evidence like that. But there are a lot of times that you don't see evidence like that. And it still is about race. It's just kind of nice when they make it obvious, right? Okay, so in 1984, they were trying to build 43 trash incinerators in the state of California. Ultimately, they only got three of those built. And in the course of that, the state commissioned a company that's still around called Sorrell Associates. So if you Google them, I'm, I'm happy that we put this online. It comes up on the top page of Google hits, because um, I'm sure they hate me for this. But the report that leaked out in 1984 showed that, and they did this report for the state on how to overcome political opposition to the siting of noxious facilities like trash incinerators. And they came up with a list based on studies all across the country on who is more or less likely to resist noxious industries. And in here, you won't find anything explicit about race. However, the three communities where they ended up building trash incinerators in the state, and also the three hazardous waste landfills that are in the state of California as well, all ended up in communities that are pretty much all monolingual, Spanish-speaking, um, Latinx communities. And if you look at this, you'll see that overlaps a lot with Catholic, low-income, high school, less education. A lot of these demographics that they know are who is less likely to fight these kinds of industries. So race is written all over this, except they didn't have to actually write it down. But this is considered the industry playbook for basically who to victimize, which communities are going to not fight you if you try to build some dirty facility. Uh, one of the most interesting parts around this on the professions, they, there's uh, a line in this report that says the one occupational um, classification that is most likely to um, fight noxious facilities, um, especially nuclear power plants, they said, how, uh, were housewives. And this was in 1984. But it's interesting that they know that women are their enemy. And they put this in writing. They know that they're the ones getting their asses kicked most often by housewives, um, especially in communities where women actually have the um, time to be able to be putting in and not having to work on um, jobs. So, of course, jobs that pay. It's, being a housewife is a job, but unpaid. But in 1991, another example of this came out. And in North Carolina, where they're trying to build a multi state nuclear waste dump this company, Effie Associates, was hired, and they went around the state, and they did a window survey, and they were basically seeing, well, who, uh, which communities are appropriate to be in or out of the siting process, and they just looked around, and they're like, oh, house is fairly wealthy, out, fairly affluent, out, residents of site minority owned, in, trailers everywhere, in, um, all these things, and most of them are talking about class, but some are explicitly about race, and they put this in writing, and this is when they decided who's going to get a new grow waste done. Thankfully, that was stopped. Um, another example, and this ties back to the Clinton executive order on environmental justice. In 1997, this is the only time you'll see this happen because there's a little fine print at the bottom of the executive order that basically says this has no teeth. The court was confused when this happened. It was actually a, a licensing board of the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And they kind of misinterpreted that as having teeth. And so in the course of it, they found a similar window survey kind of thing going on where they found out of 100 communities they started with, they drilled down to picking the one community that was the blackest community they can pick, grinding poverty, about $5,000 annual income, no running water. And they're like, we're going to put a uranium enrichment plant in this community. And the Citizens Against Nuclear Trash, can't. they fought this and stopped it. And in the course of it, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, like the agency overseeing and in bed with one of the most racist of energy industries, um, basically defined institutional racism as best as he could, basically saying that this is not going to be obvious 
and that staff need to pick, lift some rocks and look under them to find racial discrimination in the modern world. It's not going to be blatant. And so this paragraph I studied here, and you'll find this on our website, um, pulls out that powerful language where you'll see that. Unfortunately, after that, they kind of overturned this decision and basically made sure it can't happen again. Okay, so my indigenous friends will say that the history of the environmental justice movement actually started here uh, when white men first set, set foot on this continent. So you can go back that far um, or you can fast forward to um, times when like Martin Luther King was starting to organize striking garbage workers in Memphis, Tennessee. Or later on when you saw lawsuits in Houston over landfills and where they were concentrated in communities of color, particularly black communities in Houston. But it wasn't until, as um, they mentioned earlier, Warren County, North Carolina in 1982, they coined the term environmental racism. And that brought together, just that language, brought together something very powerful, created a reaction from the government where they started to study this. Of course, there are people protesting, as you saw other slides in the previous presentation. And it was the first time that the government actually studied this and they found that three of the four commercial hazardous waste incinerators, sorry, hazardous waste landfills in the southeastern EPA region were in black communities, even though black folks were 20% of that population. So that was the first evidence that there's a disparity that when they started studying it like that. And then of course, 1987, they did this House of Waste and Race um, study that Dr. Waterhouse mentioned, um, found that race is more of a factor than class in terms of where hazardous waste facilities are around the country. Redid that study 20 years later in 2007, found that the same trend in that same industry is alive and well, and they did it with GIS and more modern computer, um, computer um, research abilities. So what is environmental justice? Um, how many of you, raise your hand if you read the principles of environmental justice? Okay, raise your hand if you're going to make sure you read them <laughs> after the end of the day. Okay, that's a little better. Um, so usually I hand these around, we read through them, um, we make sure that you really understand what the movement defined environmental justice to be. Because environmental justice is the movement's response to the phenomenon of environmental racism. And it doesn't fit in a pithy EPA definition or one small paragraph. And I urge you to never use EPA's definition of environmental justice. That is the hijacking of environmental justice. And we'll talk about why that is in a minute. It was defined by the movement. It fits in a whole page. I formatted so you can print a one page version. Uh, it's to 17 principles. And one of the things in there that you won't find anywhere is the idea that if you spread it around better, we're cool with it. Not in there. There's nothing in there that says environmental equity. If you take all those harmful landfills and incinerators and just equally expose everyone, then that's environmental justice because it's not environmental justice. It goes much deeper than that. It basically says these industries need not to exist for there to be environmental justice. It's much more radical. And this is Dana Austin when she was around. This is 1991 when they first came up with these principles here in DC. And I won't, we don't have time to walk through and read the principles, so I'll just scan over these. Um, but for those of you who have read them, tell me if you remember or if you can see on this page, what's different about number 17 than the first 16? Anyone want to hazard a guess real quick? Okay, number 17 is the only one here that focuses on individuals. And I want to make a point about that. Because um, you have other ones talking about like 14, talking about multinational corporations, and 15 talks about militarism. Other ones talking about government and democracy and decision-making process like number seven. And one out of 17 they chose to make about individuals and they put it last on purpose. And, and I talked to the people who wrote it and who were there and they affirmed that my interpretation of this is correct. So, so I want to get to why I think this is a radical document. What does the word radical mean? There's some hints on this. <laughs> <laughs> What's the word radical mean? Why is it used in math class? Just call out. You're talking to lawyers, not math. Uh, <laughs> come on. Some sure of you have taken this. School, 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 yeah. the root. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's the root of things, right? The word radical, if you look it up in the dictionary, is about the root of things. So political terminology um, is about getting to the root of a problem. So I encourage you to all consider yourselves radicals, because if you're not, you're basically, as um, Dr. Waterhouse talked about, you're basically perpetuating the problem if you're not fighting it. We need to get to the roots of problems if we're going to uproot environmental racism. Now, oh, I always go ahead and throw that, <laughs> go to that slide early. Okay, so you know the punchline part of this. So I'll tell you a story real quick. Um, 
once I was a student at Penn State in middle Pennsylvania, pickup trucks are not uncommon. I saw a pickup truck that had two stickers on it. One was like a pro logging sticker. It said like, have you hugged a logger today? And the other one just said three words. It said, Smokey needs you. And I was blown away by the fact that those two stickers can be on the same truck, but more importantly, that the second sticker didn't have the message on it. What does that mean? Smokey needs you. Who is Smokey? Okay, you all know this because yeah. I just gave it away. Smokey's a bear. So, so what does Smokey need you to do? Very good, boys and girls. So we all know this since we're a wee big, if we grow up in this country, at least. And what blew me away is that this sticker didn't have the message on There was no bear on the sticker. There was nothing but Smokey needs you. And I was thinking, how is it that this message is not on the sticker? That the sticker is just a key to unlock a message that's already in my head. How much advertising money did it take to make that possible? And I was thinking, who funds Smokey the Bear? Who funds Smokey the Bear? Not quite. Um, they co-sponsor it, but if you go a lot deeper, the same entity that funds Smokey the Bear puts out ads that say, don't drink and drive, um, don't litter, wear your seatbelt, wear a condom, all these seemingly nice things. And since I was just told at 10 minutes, I'm gonna to totally blow over my time. Um, I'm gonna speed this up a lot. Um, so the Ad Council funds Smokey the Bear. They put out this and they put out all these other messages and their key thread between all those messages is Smokey's exact message, which is... Only you can prevent forest fires. fires. Exactly. And what is the key word in that only you can prevent forest fires? You. The Ad Council is corporate America. It's exactly half of the top 100 corporations in the US last time I looked. They're funding the Ad Council so that they can spend enough money that you see at least one of their messages a day on average in this country. So that you think that you're the cause of social problems and that the solution of social problems is your individual behavior, not challenging the corporations, the government, the military, the big institutions that are causing environmental racism. And that's why the principles of environmental justice are clear, or not so clear, you have to interpret them a bit, but making individual change the last and just one of 17 priorities of what needs to be done to attack environmental racism. So there's more of this story. Um, it gets much more interesting. Check out this website. You'll have these slides later, I believe. Uh, it drills into a lot more of the history of divide and conquer tactics and it's, it's fascinating stuff. Um, okay, moving on. So I skipped some slides also. They're at the end of the slide deck, if you want to refer to them, about EPA's history of environmental racism. But EPA is a history of rejecting complaints about environmental racism to their Office of Environmental Justice. Actually, 95% of their complaints they just like, dismiss, ignore, or, rule, or they eventually take like a decade or more and then rule the wrong way. So pretty miserable history. And they also are the ones that try to redefine what environmental justice means. So um, we'll, we'll belabor that right now. Okay, so justice versus equity. When they first reacted to the demands of the environmental justice movement, they decided to call things equity. Well, equity sounds good, right? We all want equality and fairness. Um, but when it comes to bad things, it means poison people equally. And that's not what environmental justice is about. It was never was about that. It's recognizing that to get to environmental justice, we do have to protect everyone because sometimes even if you redistribute the sources of the poison so that they're moved out of the urban areas and sitting in a white suburb, the poison still gets to people of color in disproportionate ways. And there are several examples of that in some of the stuff I've written up. So this website has a lot of resources, um, including a version of this PowerPoint. So check that out for the EJ principles and other things as well. Um, and this, these examples I don't have time to get into, but this is why I don't think equity is impossible. This is just different reasons why pollution reaches people in unequal ways. So I think environmental justice policy does not exist. And that's a pretty, uh, I'm, I, very, I differ with a lot of my colleagues um, when I say this, but legally we can't do policies that are strictly race conscious because courts have this color blindness notion, which is wrong headed, but they do have it. And they're gonna say, well, you can't just protect black people in the law. They're just not gonna let us do that. And so there are ways you can get around that, but one of the ways you can get around is having policies that fix the whole problem. And if you fix the whole problem, then you will unroot the unjust impacts of the current problems. So for example, if you do, for example, move to clean energy, that's actually clean. And we shut down all the coal plants and the nuclear reactors and the gas plants and the incinerators and all that stuff, that is, a big step toward environmental justice because all those dirty industries have unequal impacts. And if you make those impacts stop, 
then you have a benefit right there that affects everyone, but affects certain people more. And it's important to do that. So having laws that do protect everyone are environmental justice if you do them the right way. Not that we shouldn't be focused on who is impacted and talk about that and make that a reason for doing things, but legally to get things done, that's gonna be what's required in a lot of the ways that we're doing policy. Um, and I say that because a lot of things that are framed as environmental justice policies are actually weak efforts toward eventually getting to environmental equity, which is just far too long to wait around to get to, okay, maybe we'll get a law that will tell us if there's a cumulative impact study on who's impacted, and then maybe someone actually listen to do something about that. And I mean, it's just, it's so weak and attenuated that by the time you get to any community actually getting help, it's just, it's not strong enough. So an equity approach can be a justice approach when, when we're talking about good things, things that everyone should have equal access to, which is not the case right now. And so we need to have an equity approach for this, but I would say we need a justice approach for this too because we have such a history of inequity that we need reparations to make up for that lack of access. Um, and then there are gonna be some things I put in the necessary evils category. We want recycling facilities, we want public transit, but not everyone wants to live next to the elevated train line or next to the recycling plant. So we need to make sure that we have barrier, uh, buffer zones and that we're basically protecting the communities where those necessary infrastructure pieces are gonna be. All right, so, um, for those of you who are local, um, the, the webpage up on DC on the environmental justice impacts here, you'll see our waste facilities are concentrating in the black community. Uh, our power plants were before they were shut down and now they're getting gentrified. Um, but a lot of trends in this area and you see this in a lot of places. Um, Chester being one of the worst ones I mentioned earlier, the largest trash incinerator in the country. Um, in that county, um, here you go. Um, if you look at all the, in Delaware County, Pennsylvania, if you look at the distribution of environmental harms by every other criteria you can, you will not find as extreme of an impact as if you look at it by race, where you find three to six times, depending on which pollutants you're looking at, of a disparity between white people and people of color. Now, not all places are this extreme. There are places that are the opposite of this, um, but this is just a good example of um, what we see as a trend. Now, we have a number of mapping projects. I know EJ Screen was mentioned earlier. Um, one of our mapping projects is energyjustice.net slash map. You can use this to find dirty energy and waste facilities that we're tracking around the country. Um, we also have justicemap.org, which is where you can get easy access to race and class data down on the most local level. So this is a tool that you can use to see, well, what are the demographics? This makes it easily navigable with the Google Maps interface. And then spatial justice test, which, which stitches the two together. This is the first site, unlike EJ Screen, where you can look at not just one point, but you, don't kind of, you can look at entire industries and you can say for the coal industry or for the gas industry, are people of color or low income people disproportionately impacted across hundreds of points analyzed at one time? And no one else has built tools like this. We build, you can upload your own data sets too and just analyze anything, supermarkets, anything you want. Um, so when we looked at some of this, this is just the black population of DC area, some of the worst segregation and gentrification in the country. And this is when you overlap it with the different hazards that we've been tracking in the area and fighting. And you see big trends in terms of communities of color being where a lot of the stuff is concentrated. Okay. Um, so what we found when we looked at the big picture though, so for some industries we see, okay, like for nuclear power plants, which are anomaly, um, they're actually in wealthier, whiter communities, probably because when they built them in the seventies, they thought they were clean and didn't realize they're going to get leukemia birth defects and cancers. But the, other things are disproportionately in lower income and communities of color. And what we found, we look at all of them, like 10,000 dirty facilities at once. We found that within one mile, the average white population was 55%. Now in the country, the average white population is about 64%. So it's disparate, but still majority white. So the idea of environmental racism sometimes is overplayed. Sometimes we act as if it's all communities of color when actually most of the people of color impacted by dirty energy and waste facilities are in communities that are slightly majority white, but not as white as they would normally be if things were fairly distributed. So just to put the more accurate context on that. And when, if we were able to look at this and at some point we will look at what are the bigger facilities, what are the dirtier facilities, what are the clusters of facilities, that's where you see the more extreme cases like Chester, like Detroit and so many others. Um, this is what our environmental justice analyzer looks like. So if you ever use that spatial justice test, you'll see like for all the facilities, the white population is the red line. So all these different distances, you can see it's below average impacts until you get to hundred miles away. And most um, 
people of color um, census groups are above that line disproportionately impacted at all those different distances. And I'm going to skip over other ones because we don't have time. Um, but okay, this one is from New Jersey. This is where they looked at cumulative impact and they found that basically the amount of air pollution you're getting exposed to is directly related to the color of your skin and the amount of money in your pocket. Very strong correlation. This is from the state government putting that out. Um, so, so we're all here to talk about law. Let me talk about that for a minute because um, we haven't really been covering that. So quick and dirty history of environmental justice law and then we'll open up to questions, hopefully. Um, so in Chester, Pennsylvania, we have one minute, this is very quick. Um, <laughs> so in Chester, Pennsylvania, they argued that there's environmental racism in the building on permitting of dirty energy or dirty waste facilities in the black community. Um, the federal government said, you're right, you don't have to prove it's intentional racism. And in the course of that case, for technical reasons, it went up to the Supreme Court, it declared moot, and they were like, you have to start over with that decision. So they started over in Camden, New Jersey. Again, federal courts were like, yes, you don't have to prove it's intentional, just like all the other courts have said. And then in the middle of that, Alexander versus Sandoval happened in the US Supreme Court over English only driver's license case in 2001. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, well, it might be um, discriminatory, but unless you can prove it's intentional, then you can't sue as a private actor. There's no private right of action. That's just shut down environmental justice law in this country. So then you have things like the Louisiana case, which I mentioned earlier, and they were like, oh, the Clinton executive order has teeth. No, it doesn't. Oops, okay, well, something could happen, but that won't happen again. And Select Steel uh, was another case. So now you're basically, you can just ask EPA's Office of Civil Rights, please do the right thing, and they can ignore you. Um, so the last three things are EPA. Um, trying to basically, you can ask the government to sue itself essentially, but you can't sue them now. So Slex Steel in Michigan, EPA was like, well, as long as they're gonna follow the environmental laws once they build the steel mill, then it's following civil rights law. Wrong, but that's what EPA's opinion was. And then in California, they waited 12 years to decide a pesticide environmental justice complaint. They didn't talk to the plaintiffs. They, the kids had grown up already. They were spraying pesticides near high schools that cause cancer. And then they're like, oh, well, we don't use those pesticides anymore. We'll switch to other ones that also cause cancer, but we'll pretend that doesn't matter and just make decisions without the community. Another bad case, and that's where they did find discrimination, but it still resulted in a bad result. And then this other case from California with the hazardous waste landfills, they were basically saying, well, the state um, didn't decide where to put the landfills. So even though we gave them permits to be in Hispanic communities, or Latinx communities, um, the state's not culpable for that because the companies decide where to build. Again, ridiculous, because um, that's how all the permitting processes work. The companies decide and the state government says yes or no to a permit. So you basically can't have environmental justice underneath this current regime, which is why we have to have, to have a legislative fix for Sandoval. Um, I know Cory Booker, who I'm not going to vote for him for president, but I will support his environmental justice um, legislation that would legislatively fix that Sandoval decision so that people can have a right to sue on that again. So with that, let me just say, I have an article in here. This is a law journal that came out in DC in like 2011 um, that gives the history of Marmot Justice Law. I have copies of this if anyone wants them. And I have copies on local stuff on environmental justice in DC. And I also have a sign up sheet for folks who want to get plugged in with this work. So I'll pass that around and then we'll open up to questions. Time to take some questions in the room before jumping on the online questions. Any? Or, all right. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for very, very interesting presentations. So my question kind of goes to something that was addressed in all of your presentations a little bit, but there is a challenge with environmental racism and environmental justice issues that a lot of people don't even acknowledge that they are real. How do you kind of, in your work, deal with jumping over that hurdle uh, continuously and time and time again and not getting burned out. Wow, um, I will jump in since I said that out loud. Um, <laughs> I, for me, if you'll notice in the 21 years that I've been in this work, I've had a different job every three years. <laughs> so my strategy has been moving around uh, before I, it came, dawned on me that I should just change the way the work happens. So um, I work on in a group called the Green Leadership Trust, which is all board members of color across Big Green. And then I moved into a Big Green where I run the North America, so that's US and Canada. So after 20 years of consistently trying to make change inside of the work and say, this thing is happening, 
This is happening in my community in Brooklyn, New York, where I'm from. It's happening in the Bronx. Ask Majora Carter about digesters. It's happening, like, like just going through, trying to figure out how to be a part of the urban department in this enviro or that enviro, or work in the EPA in North Dakota, South Dakota, or Wyoming, and figuring out how to work with tribes around being poisoned and then being offered um, solar panels. There's so much to say around doing your part. And then at some point you get to a systemic analysis that helps you to recognize that if you're not directly going at a problem, you're participating in its continuance. So in my current work, I'm always asking the question, are we in the business of stopping climate change or in the business of making money off of climate change? And so I think some of it is uh, getting all the tools you can and then using them. You have to enjoy the fight. <laughs> You have to kind of be like a boxer. They don't box just to win. They kind of enjoy fighting. So there's a sense in which you have to kind of develop a certain level of enjoyment of the fight. And you spend enough time with fellow fighters, right, so you don't feel like you're fighting alone. And that can kind of recharge you. But there has to be some sense that fighting itself, I kind of enjoy this <laughs> at some level. I no, just said that um, there's hard evidence. And so if they're going to say, well, environmental racism doesn't, doesn't exist, you show them the darn studies. And if you don't have a study for your area, we built the tools so you can make a study for your area. So just talk to me, I'll walk you through it. Um, but it's prevalent enough. I mean, even in places like Montgomery County, Maryland, where all the dirty industry is concentrated in a rural, wealthy, white, I mean, fairly wealthy, white community, even there, we have environmental racism nexuses because the air pollution blows toward a very diverse county, but also all the toxic ash from their incinerator, which is the county's largest air polluter, gets brought exclusively to majority black landfill communities in South Central Virginia. And so even working with that wealthier white privileged community that can afford to pay me to help them, unlike most of the communities I help, uh, we're making demands around environmental racism to make sure that where their ash goes is done more responsibly until they get that incinerator shut down, period. Um, so even in places like that, there are connections you just need to find. I'd like to say that this is um, one of the reasons why I do use uh, the EPA definition in some of my works. Some of the audiences that I have uh, may not agree with the EPA, they may not like the EPA, but they pay attention to the EPA. And so I, it's easy for me to say, don't take my word for it. Here is some lang federal language that, that supports the things that I am uh, working on. Now, I will say the closest to that has ever come to backfiring is when a, a corporate uh, attorney once said to me in response, environmental justice is only an executive order. And that, that gave me pause. And that got some discussion here about the, the weaknesses of having uh, a, a lot of this founded on an executive or uh, a, a lot of our federal policies founded on an executive order. And so that, that has given me pause for thought. But I think that points to why I uh, will, will sometimes use those definitions. Let me make a quick note about that. So before Brown, uh, desegregation law was based on thin air. Right, so the idea is the Equal Protection Clause actually prohibited, right, racial segregation. It's just the Supreme Court didn't know it yet, right? Obviously, Congress intended it, and it was intended, but the Supreme Court allowed it. So there had to be a fight to get that kind of instantiated in law. And so I would just say the fact that you don't have the legislation or the fact that courts have interpreted wrongly what is prohibited under the Equal Protection Clause that's all made up anyway, that's all judge-made right. law, uh, doesn't mean that there isn't something real there. It just means that we have to move to make sure people recognize and acknowledge it. So I would just encourage us to see, even though, yeah, environmental justice is actually much more than what's in the EPA or uh, what's in the executive order, but surely as a matter of law, it's only the executive order that is written down stating specifically what environmental justice requires, but I still maintain that Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and the Equal Protection Clause still prohibit racial discrimination in environmental decision-making. Now, the Supreme Court has set a high bar on how to prove it, but that's a matter of a burden, not a matter of what's lawful, right? So the racial discrimination is not lawful in environmental decision-making. 
You it may just be hard for me to catch you as a murderer, but the fact that it's hard for me to catch you doesn't make murder lawful, right? And that's a distinction that we have to kind of recognize. Thank you. We have time for one more question in the room. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to add to the appreciation. Thank you all so much for coming to speak. Um, so I have a, a question that's like a little bit in two parts. Um, everyone talked about systemic change versus individual change. So um, one of the problems I have when I'm talking to my colleagues across the country is when they're trying to find people of pe my colleagues who are people of privilege, right? When they're trying to find environmental justice groups, they can't find one to really like insert themselves and get to know. They don't have websites um, a lot of times, and and people have priorities other than making an online presence. So how do you find groups to get involved in? And then on a more like smaller level is once you do find them, building that trust over time and and making it into like movement going forward. So do you have some suggestions and tips on that? Um, you call the people who know the people. And so my info's up there, one more people you can call and just say, Mike, who's in this area? And I might turn around back tomorrow who's in that area because maybe she knows the area better or some other group that would have a network in that place. Um, but there, there is no single website where you can go to find environmental justice groups. Um, we're on our mapping project eventually building in that direction, but we're more tracking facilities than groups right now. We have thousands of groups, but their information is not transparent on our website right now without them approving it. We haven't gone through that whole process. Um, but, so, but a lot of us know where to find them. So just reach out to some of the better network people and. I know who the other network people are, so we'll find whoever, whatever, just name a place and I'll be able to tell you about it or who can tell you. So I'll just add that um, if you see a person of color or an African-American inside of an environmental organization, you can ask them um, <laughs> because the community that they go back to when they're not trying to figure out how to fit their work into an environmental mandate that is not well considered is often a part of that community. There are organizations, the Green Leadership Trust, Green 2.0, uh, has a lot of, they do a report, not just the ones that tell you where the work is failing, but they actually do profiles on people who are in this work. And for every one of us, I can tell you that while we work in one form of the work, we are deeply connected to local forms of our work. It's what informs our being there. Without putting a bunch of emotional labor on people to do this work, I'd also say some of the reasons why you cannot find folks on a website is because they're not doing this for work. And, or because they're not doing it as a part of something that's being sponsored. Most of them have been dragged into this fight by the loss of life, the loss of property, and are in the middle of a traumatic situation. And for um, groups who have tried over and over again through the EPA's very different processes to get seen and recognized, those are also traumatized communities. So even the folks who have won, Charles County had a, had a win, there are things going on, those are traumatized people. And so in a, trying to fashion an approach to working with people, one of the things that we have found to work, I work in an organization that is historically deeply very white. It's only 10 years old and here it is. What I will tell you is that the co-creation of solutions is the best way to do anything. Participatory development of solutions, tables, education spaces, things that anybody who's actually, who's walking, who's telling you they can introduce you to people and you will do a thing, is giving you the nice version of it. Mike is a nice man, that's why he will tell you. Like he will he will make an introduction or he will introduce you to someone who can introduce you to someone, mostly because traumatized people aren't that excited about making friends with new people who look like people who traumatize them. So I, so I think to some extent, getting into the work is the best way to make friends and being able, if you are from a point of privilege, we are in the shadow of Maryland, the place that this used to be a part of, and let me assure you, like there are folks who are talking about what's happening with the red line in Baltimore who are connected to people in Talbot County, County all over and other rural parts of the state who don't want to be redlined out of uh, being able to have the life and lands they have because of a lack of transportation or an ignorant form of um, tone deaf transportation. Those groups don't necessarily see each other as allies except that they're being railroaded in different ways. So looking for an urban rural connection. If you are experiencing a thing and you wanna find out the other people who are fighting it, start fighting it and you'll find each other. And I think that that's probably a less prescriptive way to do it, but it's also the only way to put some skin in the game which traumatized people are more likely to respond to. Here. Let me just throw in academic institutions because I didn't hear it mentioned. So there are a number of academic institutions that work in this area, in this space, um, you know, and so you can reach out to folks in those institutions that are doing environmental justice work and you can also find where communities are that are engaging.
let me just add to these answers tomorrow remind me of something that um, sometimes it's not about reaching out directly to a traumatized community that may be overworked and not able to handle volunteers or support. Um, sometimes it's a matter of recognizing things in your own institution, community, city that are causing trauma for another community. And without that community even necessarily being organized and having a voice around that. Like the community I mentioned in Virginia where the ash is going from Montgomery County, Maryland. I, I did knock on doors there and talk to people right next to the landfill and try to reach out to them, but they're not an organized community. But that doesn't stop the moral obligation of the folks in Montgomery County to stop sending ash to their community. And so no matter where you are, there's something you're doing that's harming someone. And if you do the research, and I can help you do the research, figure out where your waste products are going, where your energy is coming from, whatever it is, how do you undo those impacts right where you are in the institutions that you can control, even if the impacts of community is not organized or ready to work with you? Thank you. And if there's no other concluding remarks, I'd just like to thank everyone so much for coming out today. And thank you to our amazing panel for providing your expertise and knowledge on environmental justice. We hope you continue to think about the money, multifaceted issues and, you know, hopeful potentials for environmental justice forthcoming. And thank you all for participating in ELI's uh, summer school series.